The Florida Department of Health also has had a number of these machines delivered, um, and so those are going to be deployed strategically in areas where you have uh, a lot of cases. Um, but I've also ordered them uh, to create uh, mobile strike teams to be able to take this and do spot checks at nursing homes and assisted living facilities to see if this is uh, spreading in those facilities, to see if staff has them. You don't even need to test everyone. If you get representative samples, then you could see if it's there. Then you really go and do more. So I think that this is something that will be game-changing for us going forward, and it's been a very, very top priority for us. The third uh, priority is one of the reasons why we're here today. Uh, we want to protect our health care workers who are on the front line, and we want to make sure that the health care system can absorb uh, what this virus is, is portending for our communities. Uh, and I'm pleased with uh, Jared Moskowitz's leadership, who's here heading our Department of Emergency Management. Uh, you know, this has been the biggest logistics operation in the history of the state. Uh, the state has distributed uh, over 3 million masks, both N95 and surgical masks, uh, almost 225,000 face shields, 4.2 million gloves, and 185,000 gowns. Um, and we have more on the way, and we're fighting to get more, particularly of the N95 masks. Uh, so I want to thank Jared for all he's done uh, to be able to get, uh, get the key supplies. And we've spoken with the mayors here. You know, I think what they're doing in terms of, like, the beach of, uh, if you're in the grocery store wearing some type of face covering, you know, I think that's really smart. The grocery stores are packed, and uh, when you have close contact, that's when this virus is most likely to be transmitted. So having the mask, um, I think, could absolutely cut down on the transmissibility of this, and I think that's a very important precaution. So we're going to work to be able to, um, to give them some more masks, and I think that that's very, very appropriate. Um, so here at the convention center, uh, we've been working with the Army Corps of Engineers over the last several weeks. Um, as many of you know, uh, when uh, this launched with the 15 days to stop the spread and other initiatives that were done in South Florida and statewide, people uh, would talk about flattening the curve uh, so that the hospital system could cope uh, you know, with the patients uh, who were impacted by this, that, this illness. And so from the very beginning, you know, we looked strategically around the state um, and made plans to be able to expand hospital capacity. Um, and so that's one of the things uh, that we're going to be doing um, here today. Uh, this facility, um, in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, will open with 400 beds uh, and 50 ICU beds for a total of 450 beds. The hospital will cover 500,000 square feet and will be able to scale up to 1,000 beds if the need is there. Um, in addition to contract staff of doctors, nurses, certified nurse assistants, respiratory therapists, and other medical personnel, the facility will be staffed by 184 members of Florida's National Guard medical team as follows. Ten physicians, 19 physician assistants, five case managers, five social workers, 25 medical clerks, 25 housekeepers, a patient transporter, 25 EMT technicians, two medical assistants, 50 paramedics, 16 registered nurses, and one licensed infection uh, preventionist. So this will uh, provide uh, a lot of resources should the need arise to be able to care for patients. And this is going to be a facility that will accept the COVID patients. You know, some of the overflow that's been done in other parts of the country, initially they wanted it for non-COVID. This is for COVID, so if somebody has it, uh, this facility is going to be able uh, to accommodate that. Um, and I think that that's something very important. Uh, so this partnership with the Corps, uh, we think is very important. We thank them for their efforts. Of course, we work with them on things like Lake o Okeechobee anyways, uh, but I want to thank um, uh, I want to thank them, General Seminite, for, for, for his leadership and for, for them really stepping up to the plate. This, though, is only one part uh, of the plan to have additional capacity. In addition to the beds here in the convention center, we're setting up 200 beds at the old Pan American Hospital um, and 250 beds um, at a field hospital right here in Miami. And those will be beds um, that are manned with medical professionals that the state of Florida has contracted with. So you're not going to have to deplete resources from the hospital systems here in Miami-Dade County. This is supplementing what's already there, but it's not taking from what's already there.
outside of Miami. We have an additional four field hospitals, as the need may be. Um, we have one that's ready in Broward, another one that can be stood up very quickly in Palm Beach. Um, and then we're also looking where on the west coast of Florida and potentially northeast Florida. Uh, but we have ready to be deployed uh, 4,300 hospital beds and almost 100, and, or actually more than 150 ICU beds. Uh, 451 nurses, 15 nurse practitioners, and 14 doctors. Uh, they're under contract, they're standing by, and they're ready to deploy. Uh, so that is why I would much rather be prepared for the worst and the worst not come here than not be prepared. And so what you're seeing here today is the state of Florida, the Army Corps of Engineers, Miami-Dade County, Miami Beach, uh, doing all we can to be fully prepared. And again, these plans have been laid for quite some time. Uh, finally, just a, um, an overview of what we're looking at in terms of hospital capacity in Florida. Um, right now, the availability statewide is 43%. Uh, Miami-Dade is 43%. Broward is almost 46%. Palm Beach, 49%. Hillsborough, 41%. Orange, 44%. And Duval, 47%. So we have capacity at the at the hospitals. You know, we don't know, um, you know, what a surge may, may bring, but we have to prepare for that uh, so that we're able to take care of people. So I think that this is the smart thing to do. I think it's the responsible thing to do. And, um, you know, I'm really glad to have the Army Corps of Engineers uh, with us. And so I'd like to be able to uh, introduce um, Lieutenant General Todd Seminite. I want to thank you for your friendship and your support and uh, for your leadership. Well, listen, Governor, to you and the other senior leaders here, um, I can't think of a better team to be able to be partnered up with to be able to uh, support such an important thing. You mentioned a little bit about the Corps of Engineers. We've been working in Florida for almost 100 years. Uh, disaster response, Everglades restoration, beach renourishment. But I can't think of a more noble task than saving the lives of the Floridians that have been infected by this virus. And just the thoughts and prayers of all of us in the Corps and in the federal government go out to all of those people, and especially the real heroes, the people that are on the front lines, the nurses and the doctors. And this ability to be able to bring this facility on, to be able to help mitigate this, is, is going to be instrumental. And this really is a team effort. Today, the Corps of Engineers is working for that man right there, the governor, okay? And we're going to work side by side with the mayors, with the city leadership, the state leadership, the National Guard, obviously the medical communities. We are here basically on behalf of FEMA to be able to help out. But let there be no doubt as to where our loyalty is. When the governor decides how they want to do this and what their plan is, we need to be able to put this in the ground to be able to make sure that we're meeting that requirement. We developed about three weeks ago what I would call a very, very standardized plan. We went to all the experts and we said, what are the medical requirements? How do we do this to code? How do we do this? Is it COVID, non-COVID? Do we do it in a convention center? What's negative pressure? And over the last three weeks, we are in the process right now of building 17 different facilities, about 15,000 beds that we're putting in the ground right now. Here's the message, though, is that we've just finished New York, just finished Detroit, and just finished Chicago. And, Governor, we have learned a lot of things by building those facilities. So this facility that we're building out, we've migrated a lot of those lessons learned. What's the best way to run a nurse's station? How do you do patient discharge? How do you work all these things? And we've integrated those back in and be able to make sure that we're leaning forward. The governor talked about 400 and then the 50 ICUs, but there's a lot of other supporting requirements. What do you do for showers? There's not a lot of showers in the convention center, so how do we bring those back in? What do we do for oxygen? How do you be able to run where it's patient receiving and then patient discharge? Uh, PPE transition, every time a nurse walks out to take a break, how do you make sure they're going through the right protected areas to be able to drop that off and then those, those things go away so they aren't, aren't hurting anything else? And that's what this whole facility is going to be able to, uh, to provide. And I think the last thing I'll tell you is that we're very, very uh, excited to work with this great team. Jared, you and your crew have been phenomenal already. And there's a colonel over there right there, Colonel uh, Drew Kelly, who works for me. He's the Jacksonville District. That colonel and everybody in Jacksonville is 100% focused. And we got a lot of tasks right now, but that colonel's focused on getting this done. This is a hard build. This is probably a three-week build. We don't have three weeks. The governor just sat with me in the trailer behind us and said, you've got till about the night of the 20th of April. So it's not design it and build it as you'd like. It's here's the suspense, get it done. 
And wherever there is a problem in the way, everybody focused on that particular obstacle, whether it's local, state, city officials to try to figure out, how do I work our way through this? How do we mitigate this? How do we get a solution that is not the perfect solution, but it sure is the mission essential solution, so we make sure that when the first patient needs to show up, there's a bed that's able to do it. So, Governor, the mayor's here. You have my personal commitment and everybody in the Corps of Engineers, and this is not Jacksonville only. We will fly whatever we need to from the United States all around the, the, our, our uh, whole domain in here to be able to get this done on time because I think what you have got with a vision right here is you've got the capacity and you've got the plan. We're just proud to be part of your team. I think with that, um, I'm going to pass over to Miami-Dade County Mayor. Thank you, General. Appreciate it. And, um, Governor, thank you. Thank you for all the support you've given us here in Miami-Dade County. And, uh, and uh, this is a, a great example of the cooperation between the federal, state, county, municipal governments. Uh, what's being constructed here is a 450-bed facility, temporary hospital, that we hope never to use. Uh, but we have to have, ha have to have it just in case that we do need, need it. It will be here uh, for our residents. And, again, I can't uh, stress enough uh, my, my gratitude to you, Governor DeSantis, for all the support you've given us here in, uh, in Miami-Dade County. Again, I can't express my gratitude enough, uh, General, General Summonite, again, for, for what uh, you're doing. And uh, Mayor Gelber, thank you for uh, allowing us to, to use your facility. They, uh, the, uh, the state called us, said, or the, actually the Army Corps called us and said, do you have a 500,000-square-foot facility somewhere in Miami-Dade County? Yeah, we do, actually. But there's only one 500,000-square-foot facility that we know of, and that's in the city of Miami Beach, and that's the Convention Center. And thank you for, for uh, using this. And this, uh, again, this is, this is a facility we hope never to use, uh, but we have to prepare for the worst. We don't know. There's a surge, supposedly, it's coming. The good news is, as the governor said, we have plenty of capacity right now in Miami-Dade County. We have plenty of hospital beds. We have plenty of ICU beds. We have plenty of ventilators. Uh, for what we think is going to come. And, uh, but again, if something above what we think comes uh, happens, then this facility will be great. The additional uh, beds at uh, Pan American Hospital are also going to be you know, a great backstop. And there's another 250 beds that are at the, at the Tamiami uh, Youth Fairgrounds that's already up and, and running that could be used for, for the same purpose. So we have a lot of capacity, which hope we never uh, need to use it. Uh, but again, thank you, and a great cooperative be cooperation between the uh, federal, state, local, local uh, governments on, on this effort. I'm going to say uh, a couple of words in Spanish. I know you're you're saying Spanish, por favor. Okay. Estamos aquí para anunciar esta una construcción de un hospital temporal en el centro de convención de Miami Beach. El, el, el hospital va a estar construido por el cuerpo de ingenieros del cuerpo de, del ejército de los Estados Unidos. Le tengo que dar gracias al gobernador uh, Ron DeSantis por todo lo que ha hecho aquí por nosotros en el condado de Miami-Dade, también el, el general uh, Todd uh, Semonite, que es el general que está en cargo de este, de este hospital, de la construcción de este hospital, y también a, al alcalde Dan Gilbert de la ciudad de, de Miami Beach. Este hospital este va, va a tener una capacidad de 450 cuartos uh, para pacientes que de COVID-19. Esperamos nunca que tenemos que usar este, este hospital. Tenemos suficiente capacidad ahora en el condado de Miami-Dade, tenemos más de 3,000 cuartos vacantes, más de, 3, 000, más de 3, 300 cuartos de intensidad, uh, ayuda a intensidad intensa, también vacantes, ventiladores, más de 700 uh, aquí en el condado de Miami-Dade que no se están utilizando. No he, hemos visto ese tipo de, de, de aumento en los números de casos que no ha, ha, para causar este, un tipo de alarma. Pero si algo sucede, algo más de lo que estamos esperando, este hospital va a estar aquí para ayudar a los residentes del condado de, de Miami-Dade. Tenemos 100 más que el, el gobernador está construyendo en el, uh, el hospital, el, el uh, hospital antiguo uh, Pan American. Y también tenemos otro hospital temporal que está en, en lo que es la feria eh, de Tamiami. Hay un hospital ahí, 250 cuartos ahí. Así que algo que no... No esperamos que vamos a necesitar para usar, pero si algo, algo sucede que necesitamos, estamos, está aquí, ya estamos preparados. Así que otra vez la gracia al gobernador Ron DeSantis por toda su ayuda, al, al general y también el, el alcalde de la ciudad de Miami Beach. 
Dan Gilbert por todo, eh, por todo que, toda la ayuda que nos ha dado para, para hacer, eh, lograr este hospital. Una cosa más, este hospital, si se necesita más capacidad, también puede aumentar a ser hasta mil cuartos. Así que eh, empezamos con 450, pero esto se puede aumentar hasta mil. Así que eso es buena noticia también. And so, y ahora, and now I'm going to turn it over to the uh, mayor of uh, the city of Miami Beach, my good friend Dan Gelber. Thank you. Gracias. Um, first, I want to acknowledge um, every morning my commission meets on the phone with our city manager. Some of them are here today. Uh, Commissioner Samuelin, Commissioner Gangora, Commissioner Richardson. On the phone is County Commissioner uh, Higgins is on with us uh, where we're talking to our city manager, trying to coordinate what we do here. Uh, multiple times a day it feels like I'm either calling or texting with Mayor Jimenez uh, as he's asking what we need and, and to talk about some of these issues. And I even regularly hear from our Governor, Governor DeSantis, to our little city here, and Jared also, who calls just to see what we need. So thank you for reaching out, thank you for caring about us, and thank you for reminding everybody that we are all in this together. We're leaning into this, and, uh, and it's just like these masks. You wear them to help somebody else, and when everybody wears them, everybody is, is elevated and, and healthier, so thank you. Um, if there is a city in America not built for social distancing, you are in it. Uh, we want people to come here to dance at their weddings, to embrace on their honeymoons, to visit our beaches, our promenades like Lincoln Road and Ocean Drive, our parks. We want them to go to our venues and our bars, um, and we want them to come here to this convention center where they come to the biggest art show in the world and walk around together experiencing something fantastic or to the Super Bowl experience where families and friends sit around and root for their favorite team. Um, but things are different right now. Things are much different. And, and just as we have to be great at all that, we have to be great at this. Our city has adopted every CDC guideline each time it's, came out, it's, it's been enacted as an emergency order. Uh, we want to lean into this. And, and that's why we're, we're, frankly, part of this with you. And we know you're going to take over our convention center. It wasn't really a question, obviously. You need to do it. Um, we find a way, we're resourceful, we're going to convert a convention center into a hospital in a couple weeks. Uh, that's something quite amazing, but frankly, it's for the entire community, including ours. Um, we find a way. This is Pride Week, by the way. We would have had our Pride Festival this week. Tens of thousands of people would, would be on Ocean Drive in a, you know, and so we, we made some masks that reflect that. We, we find a way to express who we are and to lean into this. So for, for us, I just want you to know we are, we are grateful that we all have this uh, camaraderie and, and unity of purpose. And although I agree, um, we hope that this isn't going to be used. Um, we, we pray that it's not used, but, the, but we've got to still plan. And so we are planning for the worst, and we're praying for the best, and we will be ready. And, I, and I, we couldn't be ready if, if all of us weren't working together, and most importantly, our residents weren't accepting the fact that this is something real, and they need to lean into all of these countermeasures and all of these uh, actions we're doing. So I appreciate everybody who's here, but I mostly appreciate the residents who have decided that this is important enough for them to change what they do every single day to make sure that a neighbor or someone they don't know is safe. So thank you all. Great. Anyone have questions for anyone? Yeah, so we don't want the line. I mean, so social distancing is important. Um, you know, some people uh, don't have access online. Obviously, the website was having problems. You know, we've put a lot of servers in Sunday. I think they did 62,000. You know, then it started to go a little slower yesterday. So they're working on that, and they're going to continue to do it. Um, but for people that don't have access to the Internet or just are having a tough time, you know, we want there to be options. Now, I told the folks in Hialeah, you know, if they're going to come, Hand it out when they're coming in the car. Do a drive-through. Just figure, do it in a way that's not going to create crowds. I mean, right now, you know, we have a, a respiratory virus that is transmitted when you have close, usually su close, sustained contact with somebody. And if you refrain from that, um, and you know, my my orders, you know, for for state, and I know the, the the mayor here has had this for a while. I mean, is to minimize contacts outside the household. And so that's what you have to be trying to do. So I know that they're going to try to do some with the, where the, they hand them out to people coming in their cars. And then we have a deal with FedEx. FedEx is going to print them. People can grab them. FedEx will mail them back uh, later that day. Um, so we want that to be an option. I have 
2,000 state employees identified, you know, who aren't a part of unemployment, who are in these other agencies that we're surging in. So as these applications come in, you know, they got to process them. Um, so we're, we're putting forth an effort for this that we've never really done on a thing like this in the state of Florida before. But I think it's important because of the shock that so many people uh, felt. Things were going along great. I remember when this, uh, when, when all this really started get, really getting heavy in, in March, the unemployment was 2.8 percent. I remember looking at the report thinking like, man, those were the days and that was going to change. So you have so many people that had jobs through no fault of their own. Now they're furloughed. Some will be, some have already been fired. There's other places where maybe they pay you for a little bit, but some, some of them aren't going to keep doing that. Um, so I think it's uh, really, really important for folks to be able to have access to that. So, uh, but, but don't, don't violate the social distancing. I mean, that's just what – this is what if, – if, if you stick to the plan here, you're going to be able to come back uh, to work much quicker um, on the back end. Governor, if, uh, wait, if I, if I could, I, I need to clarify something on that question. Uh, Miami-Dade opened up 26 libraries today in order to do exactly what they did in the city of Hialeah. But the pro the, we have been working for a week with, a, with, a, with the, uh, the state governor, with the governor and the state of Florida on opening these sites. And so our sites are, are a lot different. There's 26 of them. Everybody has got to uh, practice social distancing. And so you'll see, it, see a lot different operation from Miami-Dade County. So, I mean, the law is when you can file. But what I've told the, uh, Ken Lawson is, you know, if someone was trying to apply uh, on what, like last Wednesday, and the the system wasn't really working, then I think you should you should count that as the day. So he's looking at um, you know how that will uh, how that will work. But I mean, I think that, that 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 you know that's a reasonable accommodation if the system you know because I uh, when when this all happened, I told the DEO I said, look, you know, there's going to be a surge. Hire more people in the call center. Do all that. And they were like, yeah, we'll do it, but just tell people it's easier for them to go to the website. So they were telling people to go to this thing, and then it reached capacity. And so that is something that I don't think is their fault. It's something we're going to be discussing today in my staff meeting, and there are some concerns from some of our attorneys on, on issuing such an order. And so i got to get to the bottom of it, and if we can resolve it, then I may be issuing that kind of an order. I will say, though, I've seen a lot of compliance with our recommendation that everybody wear facial covering when they're inside some kind of a confined space. The field hospital is – the one in Miami is up. Um, so that's up, and so that – yeah, and then this one, they, well, we told them by April 20th, and, and, you know, normally that's a pretty tough schedule, but I think they're going to do it, and then, you know, and then they'll probably, probably exceed it. So – and this is all based off – look, these things are all being revised about when this or when that. I mean, so w what we basically said is, look, we're going to plan for kind of the worst case, do that, but, I mean, if you look at how the cases have been going and the new hospitalizations – Clearly, there's capacity uh, right now to handle what's happening. So absent a major change, capacity's there. We don't know what kind of change will be. We don't know, so that's why they're doing it. So, so that'll be there, and that basically, I think, coincides with, you know, when people think, um, well, some of these things think Florida may hit the, hit the peak. You hear different things, but, but I just think we need to be ready, and that's what this will do. Well, so, you know, our unemployment benefits, as you know, is, is set by law. Um, you know, what I told uh, our folks is, um, you know, we need to get that out. I want the people that are applying to get their benefits as soon as possible because these federal benefits, are, they're not going to be here tomorrow. I mean, that's just the way it is. I think that the feds are working hard to be able to get this money. I know I've been working with Senator Rubio on these small business loans. They've actually gotten that out. And in, even though there's been some complications to it for, for government work, I mean, it's amazing that they've been able to get that many out. So, you know, I've said get the money out, do what you do, do at the state level, and then we really want to help and prod the feds to get, get their share. The fed share, obviously, is going to be more significant than what we currently have in Florida law. But whatever we have in Florida law, you know, we obviously want to be able to give to folks.
Porque hay alguna esta preocupación sobre esos de los abogados del condado, me han dicho que hay, están preocupados por un tipo de orden. Yo no sé todavía, por eso que voy a tener una reunión con ellos para ver cuál es la preocupación también. ¿Hay suficientes máscaras o no hay suficientes máscaras? Así que si tú das una orden, tienes que dar una orden que todo el mundo pueda cumplir. Y sabemos que hay muchas máscaras que no, que no hay demasiado, no hay suficientes máscaras para todas las cosas que deseamos. Let me just, let, let me just before, um, before uh, I'll take it, so, but let me just make a point because we were talking with uh, both the mayors and I've been talking with other folks throughout the state and actually people in the White House about, okay, yeah, obviously we've got to get through this, but we'd be foolish not to plan and say, what, what does it look like? you know, once we think that the cases are declining in terms of how we interact and how the economy works. And it seems to me that standing here today, we have a huge, huge array of options compared to where we were just three or four weeks ago in terms of, for example, you go back four weeks, I mean, it was hard to find even a swab to test somebody uh, for this. Now we have this five-minute test that's available. Um, and so you look at how Florida – I mean, we've had uh, some of the areas that have been more hot spots, I think, have been connected to cruise ships. Obviously, we have people coming from all over the world all the time. Um, I would like to see these, these rapid tests integrated with some of the international travel. Um, you know, if you're coming from, like, a Brazil or coming from these other places, um, you know, it would be good to have that, those tests available and done so that as people come to Florida – you know, we know that people aren't necessarily carrying the virus. I mean, we're going through a lot here. Um, you know, Miami's gone through a lot here. Uh, other parts of Florida have gone through a lot here. We've had a lot of dis dislocation economically. We're trying to mitigate that, and we're trying to bounce back from it. But, you know, to go through all that and then just have people coming internationally or even domestically and, and seeding it all over again, I think is a problem. And so I think we need to be thinking, I'm going to talk to the president about this, uh, when you're talking about some of the, because the fact of the matter is airplanes are what brought the virus to the United States. And so we've got to think smart about this, but I think we want to have people be able to function as, as a society Uh, but I think there's ways that we can now do that much smarter. Um, but the travel, I think, is something that we're really going to have to build in some protections for. We do. I mean, so first of all, if you look at the report that the State Department of Health puts out, I challenge you to find another state that's even close with transparency. We have a debt. Excuse me. We have a dashboard that's up. You see in real time as the cases come in. Some of these other states, you know, when, we, when our numbers come in, those are fresh. Some of these other states, those are 48 hours old, and so we're doing it fresh. We now have it broken out. So you have it broken out by age. You have the number of cases, positive cases, listed in any nursing home or assisted living facility by county. We now have, because people had questions um, in terms of race and ethnicity, so we're now breaking out. Uh, by race or ethnicity. Don't have it for every patient, but the ones we do, we're putting it there. And then we're also with uh, University of Florida and Shands, uh, you know, we're supporting with, with our supplies um, a uh, kind of a, an, an investigation into some of the public housing communities. It's going to be in Jacksonville, primarily African American, to figure out underserved populations where they may be uh, not getting what they need. Now, we have drive-through testing centers. It's open for everyone, but maybe the message hasn't. So we're looking at that. We're doing some other random testing to try to figure out how many people are asymptomatic that may have it. So we're doing a lot. Uh, all that in every daily report, the number of people, either staff or, in, or uh, somebody who lives in assisted living, uh, is listed by county, the numbers. Now, it's also important to keep in mind You know, a nursing home is going to be a different environment than some of the independent living. Some of the independent living is, you know, it's like living in an apartment. People can come and go, and, you know, we've had tried to do restrictions there, but, but actually, you know, people are going to be able to make, you know, the nursing home, you have an ability to control access. And as I mentioned with the Abbott Labs test, I've told the Department of Health, you know, I want you to harness that ability to test quickly um, and do these checks in some of those facilities. Um, and so they're working on that, but I told them to deploy that as soon as possible. Now, this is, this, is, this is based on what I've seen. This is not about a projection. And so what I've seen 
you know, because we keep we keep tabs on that, is that this is not exponential. This is not growing exponentially. It's growing linearly. And so unless there is some exponential growth that I haven't seen, all right, then the capacity that we have in our hospitals should be sufficient. But some people, some models show an exponential growth. So we have to prepare for the exponential growth. But what I've seen right now is a linear growth. And I haven't seen a steep linear growth. I've seen a gradual linear growth in the number of cases. There are people leave, leaving the hospital with, that had COVID-19, and there's a number that's coming in. The, the difference, that delta, isn't a large number. It isn't, it isn't like this. There's a steady growth, but not something which I would say was alarming at this point. That could change tomorrow. And it, but the thing, I, what I would say, too, if you look, I mean, we have uh, expanded testing more here than, than, than just about anywhere. There are states that have more positive test results than Florida, and we have like three or four times as many of negative test results than they do. So we're just doing a much bigger pool. Some of them have very, I um, mean, you look at Michigan, Louisiana, some of them, they just haven't tested overall. Even though they have more positives than us, they have way fewer negatives. So that is something to do. But here is kind of how we do it because, you know, you hear someone will report somebody saying this or some model says this. You know, we really we look at the data every day throughout the day as it's coming in. So just day over day here in the state of Florida, the number of new hospitalizations for COVID-19 was net uh, negative 44, Miami-Dade negative 30. Uh, Broward, negative two. Palm Beach, negative one. Hillsborough, four positive. Orange, negative two. Duval, positive two. So we're looking at that and seeing how that is changing. You know, the positive cases are important, but, you know, Miami has gotten, you know, there's a lot of people have tested positive here who are not in kind of the, the real danger age groups. I mean, these are people who are under 55. A lot of them don't have health problems. Those are people they are positive. They isolate. A lot of them are fine. Uh, some other parts of the country um, it's more disproportionately on some of the danger groups. And so that's another thing that you look at. But you really follow that hospitalization and see how that's moving. That's not only important for the space here and keeping the hospital uh, situation under control. It also kind of gives us an indication of which direction we're going in the state of Florida. And then I would also just say, um, you know, we have a very big, diverse state. I mean, if you look at the cases throughout the state, uh, we have about 60 percent are in just the three southeast Florida counties, Broward, Miami-Dade, and Palm Beach. We've obviously diverted the vast majority of our resources to those three counties from the state because of that fact. Um, and so, you know, we watch those counties. And then there's other counties where, you know, you have very, very slow um, linear uh, growth. And so, again, and you're looking at hospital capacity, you know, that's something that if that trend were to continue is not going to put some of those other areas in, in huge jeopardy. But we watch it every day, and if we see anything that changes big time, then we obviously have contingencies for all over the state. Um, but I think southeast Florida is really the one part of Florida you know, that we've been most concerned about. But even with all the things we're doing, as the mayor said, you know, we're watching what's going on in Miami-Dade, and, and there is still capacity here, which is good news. So the state, so Jer I'll let Jared speak to kind of what, what we've distributed for protective gear. Um, and we, like I said, they distributed over 3 million masks. I think the, the, the biggest problem um, I think that, that it's had is these N95 masks. Jared ordered millions of those early March. They would be delivered, supposedly. We'd show up. They didn't go. And then this. So there's a lot of stuff on the secondary market. Um, I've talked with the head of 3M. You know, we're still working through that. But I think at these hospital numbers, you know, there's a need for PPE. As it surges, most of the folks we've talked to have said, you know, you know they, oh, they do have what they need now for this. But we're very sensitive to the PPE. That's one of the reasons I suspended the elective surgeries. Part of it was to have more room in the hospitals. But quite frankly, you know, given the hospital numbers, we were probably okay there. We just didn't want PPE being burned. So we've done a lot to really conserve that. And Jared's been, been really great in fighting for that. So you want to tell about what we've done? Uh, sure, Governor. Thank you. Uh, the governor's laid out all the numbers that have moved out of the warehouse. We're running a 24-hour operations. All of the 67 counties have their staging areas uh, stood up. I want to thank the general, the guard, the guards helping us run that warehouse. Uh, I mean, just yesterday we did another 300,000 masks out uh, of the warehouse. And so, listen, I'm, I've been well on the record uh, of the issue with 3M and the masks. I think you saw results come out of that. Uh, the president announced yesterday 
uh, two days ago now, that uh, we're going to get 55 million more masks a month uh, out of 3M over the next uh, three months. The FDA also changed their guidelines, now allowing the KN95 to be used in certain circumstances. So we have millions of surgical masks on order, millions of, of KN95s on order, and millions of N95s on order. And they're just coming in, in in different batches. And so as they come in, they do not sit. They immediately go out. And we are focusing, obviously, on hospitals, first responders, uh, and, and nursing homes. I mean, the Miami Herald wrote an article specifically showing what's going on in that space. We had over $600 million worth of POs that I personally signed that nothing could get delivered. And that's not just happening here. It's happening all over the country. It's why you've seen even in California the governor talking about putting a consortium together because where everyone's competing uh, against each other. I mean, we are competing against everybody but Antarctica uh, for, for masks. And so uh, we're going to continue to do that uh, at the division. It's our, our main focus in addition to getting these facilities up. Uh, is that PPE? We know it's life-saving stuff. Uh, we want to make sure that we're taking care of our heroes, uh, our doctors, our nurses, our hospital workers, everybody uh, on the front lines. Governor, thank you. And I'm uh, just uh, – I'm in contact every day with the White House about – the, the PPE, you know, I think I think the president correctly said, you know, the states just if you can buy it, buy it. It's quicker to do that. Then we'll reimburse you. And that's really what we, what we've done. Um, but I think the way the market has 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 um, uh, has evolved, uh, the federal government probably has an easier time at this point. So we're in constant contact. Um, and I think we would be able to, um, you know, get, get more N95s through FEMA um, at, at the appropriate time. Uh, they understand where we're going. We're very transparent about uh, how we're handling things and, uh, and where the numbers are going. And so they're monitoring that on a daily basis. I mean, obviously, they've been doing that with ventilators. I think we've seen a, a, a change in demand for ventilators nationwide. Um, but I think these N95 masks are still going to be very, very important.